This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Guys, that is Psalms 41.7, and that is the same scripture uh, same scripture rather that I used last Thursday because I am still very, very excited, and you should be as well. There's a lot of stuff to talk about today, about the fallout of everything that's happened after the drop of the Roe v. Wade decision. But guys, before we get to that, make sure that you share this episode. And not just this episode, share this show around to other people. I get emails every week now from people that are like, oh my gosh, I didn't know your show until you went on this other guy's show or until my buddy shared it with me. And so this is having an impact on a lot of guys around the country and around the world, frankly. And so be the guy that shares it with somebody else. And also guys, as I've told you, for the most part, the only way we're able to keep the lights on around here is because of donations. We get a little bit of money from advertising, but overwhelmingly it is guys just like you that are supporting us. So if you like all the work we've done on abortion, because that's been the DMs and the emails that I've been getting is like, man, I just love what you're doing on abortion. You're equipping me to be able to, you know, have these debates with my friends or at my church or at my, you know, office place or something like that. The only way we're able to do that is because guys like you hopping on board, helping us out. So go to undaunted.life backslash donate. That's just on our website, undaunted.life backslash donate. Guys giving everything from five bucks a month all the way up to 500 bucks a month and, you know, everything in between and all over the place. We love you guys. We really, really appreciate it. And so we're not going to be doing a quick hitter segment this week because we've got way, way, way too much to discuss. And guys, we're likely going to get into some great stuff next week because, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States has been on a heater lately. And so we need to talk about a lot of those different things, but nothing can be bigger than talking about the fallout of owner overturning Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And little quick aside about that. So last week, whenever uh, my buddy Brandon called me and told me about it, you know, told me the news, and I immediately did like a, an Instagram live or something like that, and I immediately went up and recorded. For whatever reason, on that Instagram live and on last Thursday's episode, I said Doe v. Casey as opposed to Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Like, I don't even know what Doe v. Casey is. I think it has to do with some, like, CIA case or something like that. But for whatever reason, Doe v. Casey was stuck in my head. And so I, I re-recorded that one little section and re-uploaded last week's episode. But there were probably several thousand of you that heard me say Doe v. Casey. But yes, I do know what I'm talking about. I just misspoke, so I did want to kind of get that out there to you. But I want to go ahead and read these words from Samuel Alito's majority opinion, uh, because they are really some of the greatest words ever written. And guys, I will have the entire decision in the show notes. Like, you know, there is some legalese in there, but especially Justice Thomas's decision, like, man, it's just aces. But I have to read this from Samuel Alito's majority decision here. We hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, that provision has been held to guarantee rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. So uh, that's basically, the, those are the words right there that made Roe and Casey go to the trash heap of history. Just amazing. But it was interesting. It's interesting to note this about the dissenting opinions. So we had three dissenting justices in this opinion. That's Elena Kagan, Sonia Sotomayor, and Stephen Breyer, who's about to be leaving the court for uh, Kintanji Brown Jackson. But basically, in their dissents, they give their dissenting opinions, and they're not using a single constitutionally based argument. Like, none at all. Again, you can read it right there in the decisions in, in the entire court opinion because there is no constitutional right to an abortion. Because in, in actuality, nobody, including the three dissenting Supreme Court justices, are making a legal or judicially based claim as to why Roe v. Wade should not have been struck down. It was all, you know, feelings and, and precedent. And again, precedent is only important to these people when it's something that they like. When it's a decision that they don't like or something that, you know, is clearly unjust, they're, you know, they're all about precedent then. But but right now they're they're trying to force precedent in and they're they're not saying that it's a good thing. Like it's just it's a whole bunch of nonsense. And and right from the jump here, guys, and here in a second, I'm gonna give you kind of the rundown of what today's episode's going to be. Let me tell you what I'm not going to be doing today. Okay, so the first thing I'm not going to be doing is a deep dive into the legal breakdown of the Dobbs v. Jackson women's health case, okay? So the, the, the reason is, is because that's not really my forte, right? So I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand a lot of the legalese. I'm also not going to be doing a deep dive of the reactions by woke lefty Christians. I will have a little bit of that in here, but I'm not doing a deep, deep dive into that, okay? 
So I did my immediate reactions last Thursday, so I'm not giving you immediate reactions. Now I'm going to go a little bit deeper. But for your edification, I'm going to refer you to a couple of different folks for kind of the legal breakdown and then kind of the woke lefty breakdown. So I thought that Ben Shapiro on last week's episode, it was episode 1522, Goodbye Roe v. Wade. He did a great job of breaking down kind of the legal standards that were used in this case. And then in terms of the woke lefty Christian breakdown stuff, I'm going to refer you to my buddy John Cooper because on episode 118 of Cooper stuff, uh, you know, entitled Goodbye Roe, my emotional roller coaster. He basically hammered, you know, a lot of these woke Christians and kind of the stuff that they're doing. And so I don't really just want to repeat the things that they're saying. So I will have you know, a link in the show notes to Ben Shapiro's episode and to John Cooper's episode. But here's what I'm going to be going over today for this podcast. So you can kind of know where we're going. So I'm going to give the immediate reactions to the news that we got from all over the place, the narratives that have come out since the Dobbs decision was handed down, the narratives that should have come out since the Dobbs decision was handed down, what we can expect to see and need to watch for. And then I've got just a few random thoughts. And then at the end, that's where the rubber really, really meets the road. And that's the work that needs to be done now on the pro-life side, on the Christian side of this issue. Okay. Now, also, in case you don't listen to the entire episode, I want to make sure you know this, that there are going to be some resources that will equip you guys mentally and spiritually to push back against pro-abortion rhetoric. All these things are going to be in the show notes. So episode 257 of this podcast is called How to Engage Pro-Abortion Arguments. It's one of the most important episodes we've ever done, perhaps the most important episode that we've ever done. You can really dig into the different arguments. And so today I'm not going to be doing a lot of debunking of, you know, pro-abortion arguments because I've done that so often before, but episode 257, but also a couple of books that really influenced me in this particular topic. So it's a book abortion by the great rc sproul and then also the book what to say when by sean carney and steve carlin these these books are great resources to kind of equip you to think about this issue in a spiritual way but also to think about it in a rhetorical way to where you can push back against these things and also before we start digging into immediate reactions and everything there are a lot of people that deserve our gratitude for roe v wade and for Planned Parenthood versus Casey being overturned. So the first is not technically a person, but it, the first is God, obviously. God was able to do so many things to be able to allow us to have this happen that you know, it's only by his sovereignty that we have the ability to even be you know, excited about what's happening right now. Also, all of the people that have dedicated their time, energy, and money to the pro-life cause over the last almost 50 years. There are a lot of people that have been a part of this cause that are not here anymore that did not get to see this day, but it's because of all those incremental things that we've done over time. I know some of you are like, incrementalism bad, but all those incremental things done over time got us to where we were last Friday. Also, the justices that voted to completely overturn and overrule Roe and Casey. So suck it, John Roberts, one of the you know, spineless jellyfish that he is. He was not technically a part of that. He voted for the Dobbs decision, but not to overturn Roe and Casey. So the justices that voted for completely overturning those unbelievably terrible cases were Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, the GOAT, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. And the courage it took for them to do this, you know, after the leak, uh, the courage, especially for a guy like Kavanaugh, there was a, someone tried to kill Justice Kavanaugh at his home, right? And they still had the courage to go through with this. So they definitely deserve uh, a lot of praise and our gratitude. Also, George W. Bush for nominating the guy that wrote the majority opinion, Samuel Alito. His father, George H.W. Bush, for nominating the GOAT, Clarence Thomas, and putting him on the court. And then Donald J. Trump for nominating Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett in that order. But also one other person that I really thought about in terms of all this was cocaine Mitch McConnell. Okay, Senator from Kentucky, he did some finagling uh, towards the end of the Obama administration that kept Merrick Garland off of the court. And because of what he did, he also was able to get Amy Coney Barrett on the court. So a lot of Republicans, for whatever reason, don't like Mitch McConnell, you know, whatever. But I will, will always remember Mitch McConnell for doing the things that he could do in the Senate to make sure that a, an extremist like Merrick Garland did not end up on the court and it opened the door for ACB. But also, and again, before we get into everything again, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We cannot forget that over 60 million babies were murdered because of the almost 50-year reign of Roe v. Wade in this country. There's a lot of chest bumping, a lot of high-fiving going on right now, and I'm all for it. I'm here for all of it. But, man... I just think about that number. There are, if you count everyone that's here legally or illegally in this country, it's about 350 million people. 60 million have been murdered over about 50 years. We're killing on average a million babies a year in this country. Okay. That can't be forgotten. 
But let's go ahead and get into the immediate reactions to the news. So immediately there were trigger laws in states that went into effect all over the country. So let's break down where the states are right now, because this is very, very, very important. So and a quick note from the beginning is no state will technically be 100 percent in terms of banning abortion, because every single state in the union right now uh, has an allowance for abortion to, quote unquote, save the life of the mother, which, as I've explained before, is not a real category. There is not something that can happen, not an ectopic pregnancy, not, you know, a septic uterus, not, uh, you know, intus- or uh, uh, chromioamnionitis or like there's nothing that could happen with the mother where the only thing that you can do from a medical side is kill the baby that's inside of her. That is a falsehood that's been spread out all over the place. But to save the life of the mother, it's not technically a category anymore. But let's go ahead and get into the breakdown of the states. So here are the states that as of right now have a total ban except to save the mother. So that's Alabama, Arkansas. Kentucky, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and West Virginia. Now, here are the states that have a near total ban except to save the mother and then also in the cases of rape or incest. So you have my state, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Idaho, Utah, Tennessee, North Dakota, and Wyoming. Then here are the states that have pre-viability abortion ban. So by viability, they, they technically mean about 22 weeks because that's about, uh, you know, usually the laws are between 22 and 24 weeks because that's when a baby can, with help, live outside the womb. So think heartbeat bills. So here are the states that have those things on the books. That's Ohio, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Indiana, Nebraska, and Iowa. So that is half the states. That's 25 states with some kind of an abortion ban, you know, a significant abortion ban, if you can call it that. But then we have to get into the states that have other categories. So here are the bans up to the point of viability. Okay, bans up to that point, not pre-viability, but up to that point. So Montana, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Kansas, and Virginia. Then we get into the very states with very, very few restrictions, even after viability. So that's Maryland, California, Hawaii, Delaware, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Nevada. And then we get into the worst of the worst states. These are the states with no restrictions whatsoever on abortion. That's New Jersey, Oregon, Alaska, Colorado, Minnesota, New Mexico and Vermont. So quick note here, there will still be some movements in a lot of these states. Okay. So some states are going to be uh, moving to change their state constitutions to enshrine the right to abortion while other states are going to move to ban abortions completely. We're going to see a lot of moving parts here over the next several months. We're having sessions, uh, you know, state houses that were out of session that are being brought into session to talk into this. And so technically everything in between is going to be up in the air at this point, but that's kind of where we sit right now. But some other reactions here. Co-President Biden was woken up from his third nap of the morning to give, and he was given this news. They wheeled him out in front of the camera long enough for him to say how disappointed he was in this decision. You know, he actually said, you know, abortion is going to be on the ballot in November. And again, as I've said on the show before, people really vote emotionally. So maybe this will have an, an impact on the electorate. But it seems clear that right now people are going to be voting with gas prices and inflation in mind. But, you know, we'll see in November. Biden called last Friday's decision a sad day. OK, and the fact that he called it a sad day, that was a direct quote, should tell you everything you need to know about this guy's supposed Catholic faith. He's such a deeply devout Catholic, and yet he called it a sad day when the United States Supreme Court decided to hand the decision back to states as to whether or not they should be able to kill babies. Sad day. Also, his administration made the almost immediate move to allow federal employees to have their sick days covered if they need to leave the state for, quote unquote, health care. Okay. So considering the timing of this and considering the language of that, this is clearly uh, about people that need to leave the state for abortion. This is technically a breach of the Hyde Amendment, which is where the federal government cannot fund abortion. But again, Joe Biden spent 40 years of his life saying, yes, Hyde Amendment good. And until five seconds ago, he's like now, you know, Hyde Amendment bad. But, you know, we don't know if that's actually going to come to court or something like that. But that is technically a breach of that amendment. Also, some reactions. Prominent Democrats like Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senator Elizabeth Warren, they've called for the ending of the filibuster in the Senate. And to his credit, or or maybe just by he said it by accident, co-president Biden said he wasn't considering a push for that, but that was an immediate reaction. Another reaction is like magic. This was this was truly magical. Okay, that this was like watching David Blaine up close. Every leftist and Democrat in the country remembered what a woman is. And we'll talk way more about that here in a second. But that was like the immediate reaction. It's like all this talk of women's rights and what are women going to do and women are going to die. It's like, do you hear yourself? 
Have you been hearing the stuff you've been saying the rest of Pride Month? Which, guys, isn't this the best way to cap off a of Pride Month? Turning it from Pride Month into Life Month? I mean, I think it's great. Some other reactions, protests all over the country, so especially in D.C. outside the Supreme, the Supreme Court. But, you know, up to this point, and there are a lot of entities that are kind of like, you know, paying attention to this, the protests have not been as bad as I thought they were going to be. OK, so, uh, you know, protesters essentially held politicians captive in the Arizona State House, and that was terrible and horrific. Um, there was a cop that was set ablaze by this guy that was using like a flamethrower in Los Angeles. Absolutely horrific. I think the cop did survive. But uh, we haven't seen what I was expecting to see, which was basically George Floyd summer all over. It's still to be seen. We're not even a week out. So we have to kind of keep paying attention to that. But there are a lot of Democratic politicians out there that are using very insurrection type language. They're just kind of throwing it out there, you know, fight like hell. We've got to fight back and we've got to do all these different things. Basically the same things they got onto Trump for saying right before the January 6th, uh, you know, storming of the Capitol. Right. But hey, that's neither here nor there. Apparently another reaction is, is abortion clinics in several states immediately like that morning, last Friday morning, they paused their planned baby executions that they had on the books for that morning. I mean, the same morning that the Dobbs decision was handed down, they paused all of their murders. Which, I mean, I mean, super duper praise God for that one, right? But then we also had some reactions from many Christians, Christian churches and, you know, Christian organizations. They showed their full-throated excitement over the news. But there were a lot that didn't, okay? And that's something that we need to be paying attention to because something that I put out on social media is that if your pastor did not mention anything about the Roe v. Wade decision being overturned this past weekend, you should maybe be wary of that man over time. Because that doesn't mean you have to get rid of whatever you're going to be talking about that Sunday, but you should at least address it, right? I mean, you ultimately should address it. There was some douche on Instagram that's kind of in the same space that I am that is like, you shouldn't be telling pastors what they should or shouldn't say and all these different things. And it's like, well, well yeah, I can, I can tell my pastor you should say this. I can technically do whatever I want, right? It's whether the pastor takes it under advisement. But if a pastor is not showing tremendous amounts of excitement over this, like, yes, you should be worried about that person, because ultimately, aside from the Emancipation Proclamation, this was the biggest legislative achievement in the history of the United States that was mainly pushed by Christians. Like, can you name me another one that was this significant? Because, again, it was mainly Christians for these 50 years that were pushing to get Roe v. Wade overturned, right? Why, why in the world would we not celebrate that? Again, at, at my church— Right there, there were just, there was a mention during the prayer and a mention at the very beginning of the sermon. And then my pastor got back into talking about Proverbs. Totally fine. He acknowledged it. Right. And then there were certain pastors that just, you know, crumbled up their, their sermon for that Sunday and just said, Hey, we're going to do, uh, we're going to push the schedule back and we're going to talk about that this week. And I thought that would be amazing. But also one little side note is where are all the pro-lifers for Biden people? They seem to be awfully quiet right now. These people that just, you know, they couldn't get behind Trump, right? Even though he's one of the main reasons why this even happened. But where are they now? Isn't that interesting? Also, immediate reactions. We had companies all over the United States, okay? They immediately began stumbling over themselves to announce that they would be paying for the women that work at their companies to kill their unborn babies if they so decided to, but didn't have access to an assassin in the state that they currently reside in. OK, so here is a list of companies and these are in no particular order. But and there's there's maybe even more since, you know, I started putting these notes together a few weeks ago. But I am keeping a list of the companies that will pay for women to murder their babies. Disney, Tesla, Lululemon, Dix, more on them here in a second. Comcast, that's uh, NBC Universal, Citigroup, Salesforce, Match Group, Bumble, Lyft, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, Yelp, Uber, Netflix, Box.com, Levi Strauss, Warner Brothers Discovery, Nike, Starbucks, Kroger, Alaska Airlines, Zillow, Goldman Sachs, Amazon, Reddit, DoorDash, Airbnb, MasterCard, Patagonia, PayPal, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Match.com. And more seemingly being announced every day. OK, there was even, uh, you know, an open letter that went around. So apparently Amazon employees went a step further. They sent an open letter to the company's management demanding that their employees get time off to mourn the ending of Roe v. Wade. Also, they demanded that the company stop operating completely in states with pro-life laws. OK, so that's the thing that happened. But let's talk about Dix, which is, you know, aptly named. There was a joint statement that was released by Ed Stack, who's the former CEO, longtime CEO of Dick Sporting Goods and Lauren Hobart, who is the current CEO. So I just have to read this entire thing because it was it was making the rounds and it's absolutely astonishing. And then we'll kind of break it down. Dear teammates, 
You are the heart of our business, and we are committed to protecting your health and well-being. Today, the Supreme Court announced a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, removing the federal right to an abortion and leaving the decision up to each state. While we do not know what that decision each state will make in response to this ruling, we at Dick Sporting Goods are prepared to ensure that all teammates have consistent and safe access to the benefits we provide, regardless of the state in which you live. And this is in bold here in their letter. In response to today's ruling, we are announcing that if you stay or if the state that you live in restricts access to abortion, Dick Sporting Goods will provide up to four thousand dollars in travel expense reimbursement to travel to the nearest location where that care is legally available. This benefit will be provided to any teammate, spouse or dependent enrolled in our medical plan, along with one support person. We recognize people feel passionately about this topic and that there are teammates and athletes who will not agree with this decision. However, we also recognize that decisions involving health and families are deeply personal and made with thoughtful consideration. We are making this decision on our, or so our teammates can access the same health care options regardless of where they live. So choose and can choose what is best for them. Okay. So that's from Dick's Sporting Goods. So the interesting thing about Dick's and all these other companies is that they are willing to pay thousands of dollars for women to leave the state that they're in in order to kill their babies. Okay. That like they're willing to do that. But most of these companies have terrible or non-existent maternity policies. Dick Sporting Goods, in particular, they don't have a maternity policy. You essentially, you know, don't get paid for that time or you just have to take the time off or you just end up not working there. Okay? So essentially, they want you to kill your kid so that you can stay at work. This is Dick's and the rest of them. They want you to kill your kid so you can stay at work and allow them, the company, to profit off of your work and they will financially incentivize you to do so. But if you choose to have the kid, they don't really care to help you. That's not really what they're there for. They don't really care about their maternity policy. They'd much rather shell out the money for you to kill your kid. So these companies would rather pay a few thousand bucks here or there to have a woman kill her baby than to potentially lose her productivity for a few months or potentially for life. That's what this is. Okay, so so to be clear, these companies do not care about women at all. Like a lot of people are like, oh, this is great. This is so uh, wonderful. These people care about women. No, no, no. They don't care about these women at all. These companies care about money, okay? And if a woman has more children, uh, then the likelihood of her being more loyal to her family than to her company goes up considerably. I mean, obviously, they know that. And so this is just basic mathematics. It is much cheaper to pay a woman to kill her child than to pay for her maternity leave and to pay for an additional person that's going to be added to the health insurance plan, okay? This isn't altruism, not by any stretch of the imagination, And these companies are being praised for it, which just think about how crazy that is. We want you to kill your kids and hey, it's no big deal, right? That's just kind of crazy. But one of the members of my team here at Undaunted Life, uh, they they said something to me along these lines. It was in reference to all these women, you know, walking around in handmaid's tail outfits outside the Supreme Court and all these different things. They're they're, they're pretending like they're living in a United States that, that is just absolutely all over them, right? But the thing about it is pretending like the life they're living right now in the U.S. is anything at all like what is described in the women from the novel is is absurd, okay? But what my buddy was talking about is how dystopian it is that modern companies are paying women to kill their children so they can stay at work and be more productive. That's The Handmaid's Tale. That's the dystopian novel, right? That's more like The Handmaid's Tale than anything we've seen in modern society, okay? And a little side note before we move off this reaction. If you live in one of these murder vacation states, because a lot of states came out immediately and were like, hey, come to our state. You know, we'll use taxpayer funding to, to make sure you can come here and kill your baby. Or if you're living in one of these states that is near a state that is banning this and, you know, Dick Sporting Goods is sending people over into your state to kill their babies. So states like California, Illinois, you, you know, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and so on, they're going to start advertising for these women to travel to their state to get an abortion. They're going to be using your taxpayer dollars to do that. To those of you that live there, you really should consider moving. Because your tax dollars are going to be directly paying for women to have a vacation in your city with a baby in their stomach and to leave without one in their stomach. I mean, that's pretty rough. And I don't know your situation and, you know, I don't know where you live and I don't know how easy it's going to be for you to move. and I don't know your family situation and all that. But of all the things that can make somebody want to move, that's pretty high up there. All right, so my other reactions, there was a steady spread of disinformation that we saw. You know, a lot of people are spreading crap about ectopic pregnancies, septic uterus, and miscarriages, saying that these women will be charged criminally if those things happen. All those things are a lie. 
all those things are completely alive. So let's talk about, you know, miscarriages, um, you know, with the DNC. So basically, let's say you miscarry and, and my wife had two miscarriages. So I, I know something about it. I know a lot of people that have had miscarriages that you know, the baby died inside the woman. They had to get a DNC. So they basically had to have the, the baby scraped out of the uterus in pieces. The baby's already dead from miscarry. OK, none of the laws on the books on those 25 states that have decent, you know, bannings of different abortions would apply to that situation at all. So it's complete farce. It's complete disinformation. Also, no state will have a law on a book on the books that will criminalize a woman for trying to get an abortion. OK, now I vehemently disagree with this. OK, because the only people that are criminalized in any of these laws around the country are the doctors. But think about it in any other scenario. If I pay some dude off the street to kill my wife, right, whether he does so or not, I go down for that as well. If he falls through with that murder and he gets caught, he's going to point at me and be like, well, that guy gave me 10 grand to do it, right? So he's going to go down and I'm going to go down for that, okay? But somehow it's different when a woman pays an assassin four or 500 bucks to do it. Also, one more thing on the disinformation front, there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what an abortion is, okay? So abortion is the intentional and targeted destruction of an innocent human life, okay? The intentional and targeted destruction of an innocent human life, treating a woman for an ectopic pregnancy, or tubal pregnancy, like, or any of those other things, it's not an abortion at all. Not at all. Like, in all cases, the doctor should work to preserve the baby's life and the mother's life. And in a lot of cases, like, especially with ectopic, like, I, I think there's a 0% chance a baby can survive that because we don't currently have the technology to flush the, the baby out of the fallopian tube so it can be implanted in the uterus. So again, people are just throwing these things out there and they're, they're basically speaking nonsense. So a couple more reactions I want to get into is we saw a bunch of you know, opinions rolling in from leaders from around the globe. So side note, I mean, who gives a crap what these people think about our laws? Like they don't live here. They can't vote here. They shouldn't care what I think about their laws. Why? Because I don't live there and I can't vote there. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these people. The first person is from Emmanuel Macron. So he's the president of France. He had this to say after the Dobbs decision came down, quote, abortion is a fundamental right for all women. It must be protected. I wish to express my solidarity with the women whose liberties are being undermined by the Supreme Court of the United States, unquote. So fun fact, the Dobbs case, which is a case here in question, but that the Supreme Court ruled on was looking at the question of whether or not the state of Mississippi Mississippi could ban abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Okay. That was the, the crux of this entire case. The current law on abortion in France concerning legal abortions, they've criminalized abortions after 14 weeks. Whoopsies. So here he is complaining about the plight of these American women, but apparently he has no idea what was even you know being considered in this decision. And then you have the dictator of Canada, Justin Trudeau. He said that American women are welcome in his country of Canada to protect their rights to bodily autonomy. But at the same time, I find that very interesting because these women can't enter the country unless they're vaccinated. So if it has to do with them killing the baby that's inside them, that is not part of their body, bodily autonomy counts. But when it comes to, you know, basically injecting an experimental drug into your arm, that super duper counts in terms of, you know, that doesn't count, I guess, in terms of bodily autonomy. So it's kind of hard to keep all that straight. But those are the reactions, kind of the immediate reactions that we saw. Now we need to get into the narratives that have come out since the Dobbs decision was handed down because everything is about narrative, especially when the mainstream media has anything to do with it. So the first thing, this is not really necessarily the mainstream media. This is mainly coming from Christians. It's that Christians really should not be dunking on this issue. We shouldn't be high five and we shouldn't be chest bumping. And again, John Cooper goes into great detail on that in his episode of Cooper stuff. Again, it's in the show notes, but there was a tweet from the gospel coalition that came out in the last couple of days. And it said this, now isn't the time for the church to beat its chest in celebration of a victory in the culture war. This is a moment for us to step up in love. Again, something called the Gospel Coalition, talking about love, not defining it, just implying it because they assume all of us understand. But why shouldn't we be excited about this? Again, the biggest legislative thing since the Emancipation Proclamation that was basically pushed by Christians is this. But that's the narrative is Christians really shouldn't be dunking on this. We should be focusing on all these other issues, but I don't want to take any of this thing away from John Cooper. Make sure you check out his episode. Another thing that we're seeing in terms of narratives is that women will die. Women are going to die now. I hope you're happy. Women will die. First of all, what is a woman? Do you want to, do you want to engage with that at all? Because it's going to kind of go against your worldview. So let's be careful in the words we use. And to answer that is no, they won't. Tons more females 
right, that have the potential to grow into women will not be slaughtered now. That's a good thing. And again, you do not need an abortion in order to save your life if you're a woman. It's not true. It is a complete lie, okay? Another narrative that has come out. There's been an overwhelming focus on quote-unquote women's rights, okay? Now, this is still June after all. I thought men could get pregnant too. I mean, this seems deeply and oddly bigoted to be talking so much about women's rights, especially during Pride Month. I personally am flummoxed and embarrassed and offended. I'm all those things all at once. Because you hear a bunch of idiots saying, you know, it's supposed to be a decision between a woman and her doctor. Well, yeah, if she's banging her doctor. Because here's the other thing. Again, people don't think about this issue for longer than 14 seconds at a time. Women aren't typically going to their primary care physician or their family doctor or their OBGYN to get this murder done. They're not. They have to find this hired gun and this hired gun doctor who wears a white coat covered in blood basically specializes in this depraved act. Oh, it's just a decision between a, a, a woman and her doctor. Really? And, and again, I keep hearing about all the rights of the mother. But one thing that never comes up in this discussion, I don't want to get too far you know, off. I'll, I'll come back. But something that's never brought up are the rights of the father. Essentially, it's because the father has no legal say as to whether or not his baby is murdered. Right? He, he can't say, no, you can't have this abortion. He has no rights to stop the woman from doing that. However... That same man can be imprisoned if he doesn't financially care for the baby after birth. At the very least, he's going to have his wages garnished. But we don't ever get to talk about that, right? Because that's somehow beyond the pale. But again, it takes two to tango in these scenarios, but dad doesn't get a say. That seems pretty effed up. Also, some people are trying to dunk on this whole thing by saying, oh yeah, well, if you're going to force women to be pregnant, you know, uh, you should probably force men that impregnate them to start paying child support immediately. And they think they're dunking. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm super cool with that. Let's have these men start taking care of these women as soon as they impregnate them. I'm all for it. But also, we already have a process by which this happens naturally. It's called marriage. I know it's kind of old fashioned to me to even mention that word. But if you weren't just screwing everything that walked, and, you know, risking getting pregnant just because you love your sexual freedom or something, right? If you do this within the confines of a marriage, as, as you can imagine, the rates of abortion inside married houses between married couples is incredibly, incredibly low compared to just the general populace, okay? But then we also saw this narrative shift. There's an overwhelming focus on reproductive rights or reproductive freedom. But again, this this shows that these people don't think much on this issue, and they also don't understand what reproduction means. Because if you don't, if you understand what reproduction means, you know when it happens. So the moment the sperm cell meets the egg cell and creates a one-celled zygote that has all of the DNA and all the genetic code of that person that will basically you know map out the rest of their life, tell us how tall they're going to be, what eye color they're going to have, you know what color hair they're going to have, and how coarse it is and how thick it is. It's all there in that exact one moment. At that moment, reproduction has occurred. So as the baby's growing in your stomach, you don't get to decide whether or not to reproduce. You've already done so. So this focus on reproductive rights is nonsense, okay? Also, a narrative being pushed is that the Supreme Court of the United States is, is radical or it's, or it's activist or it's extremist now, okay? So the justices are being called extremists for returning the rights of the people Back to the people. That, that, that's an extremist activist position, okay? Because essentially they took something out of the judge's hands and out of the federal government's hands and they put it in the hands of each individual voter in each individual state. And this is supposed to be a bad thing? We're supposed to look at this and be like, oh, this is terrible. Let's keep it in the federal government's hands. Really? And it is interesting that all these liberal people that are calling for, you know, the expansion of the Supreme Court, because you would think they, they would want this to be a neutral thing, right? Oh, this is a radical conservative Supreme Court, right? But the interesting thing is that they're, they're, they're doing this because of this supposed extreme conservative majority, but none of them want a neutral court. They want an extreme liberal majority on the court. Again, this is why worldview matters, because they will call you radical activists and extremists if they don't agree with you. But they're not going to call themselves that. 
So if they get rid of the filibuster and add, you know, seven more people to the Supreme Court or, or something like that, like they're not going to call that radical or activist or extremist, especially if those justices vote the way that they like. So another narrative shift we've seen is the Supreme Court of the United States, you know, removed a fundamental constitutional right from women in our country. You know, our women are the only, you know, our daughters are now waking up and having less rights than their grandparents did or, or something like that. Well, if you're one of those people, I would just say, oh, yeah, well, show me in the Constitution the right to abortion and I will change my mind. Go ahead. Show me. Because you're saying we removed a fundamental constitutional right. I believe Joe Biden said that verbatim. Fundamental constitutional right. Show me in the Constitution where it says that. And don't do any mental gymnastics. Just show me. And the thing is, is that you can't. Another narrative shift is they're coming for gay marriage and interracial marriage and contraception next, right? And so this has to do with Justice Clarence Thomas, which, again, you should should read his opinion in there. It's amazing. In his remarks in the concurring opinion uh, where he's talking about the substantive due process clause. And again, I'm not going to go into a deep dive of the substantive due process clause and how that ties into the 14th Amendment. But he explicitly says in the decision, and Alito did as well, that this decision does not set up a challenge to Obergefell, which is gay marriage or interracial marriage or married people having contraception or any of those things. Again, they're lying to you about that, okay? And people are buying it hook, lying and sinker, okay? The next thing, the shifting focus to make abortion unthinkable, okay? Now, pro-abortion folks and, you know, supposed, supposed pro-life folks are using unthinkable now. Let's make abortion unthinkable, okay? So what they're talking about is they're talking about the plight of the woman after she has the baby, OK, because most of these women wouldn't kill their babies if everything was taken care of them. That That's kind of what they would say. But they're using this phraseology, this making abortion unthinkable as a Trojan horse to push universal health care and universal pre-K and paid maternity leave and climate change laws and living wage increases and, and all kinds of other things. Right. And so this kind of builds into the people not being su sufficiently pro-life for some reason, because they don't support all these other policy prescriptions that don't have anything to do with the woman deciding to kill her child or her and the man that did it deciding to kill her child or her and her parents that don't want to be embarrassed at the next cookout to kill her child. Right. And, and that's kind of gets into the next thing is, you know, you're not actually pro-life unless you believe the exact things that I believe. Right. So what they mean is they want you to support all of their policy prescriptions and they get to determine whether you're pro-life enough. Okay. And, you know, what they mean is you have to be pro all the things I just listed, but also things like anti-death penalty, right? So I just did a debate. I sent it out to all you guys with Shane Claiborne. This guy is a professional Christian, anti-gun, anti-violence, pacifist activist, right? That's what this guy does for a living. He literally goes on tour around the country convincing people to turn law-abiding citizens, to turn in their firearms to him so that they can destroy them right there in front of them, Right. And he was talking about this and he brought this up on the show, you know, how you're not sufficiently pro-life if you're also pro-death penalty. And he completely ignored the fact of these two groups being very, very different because in this country, the only people that we put to death are people that murder other people. And usually there's a compounding factor like, you know, there was a kidnapping and then a murder or a kidnapping and then a rape and then a murder or it was multiple people that were murdered or it was under, you know, especially egregious circumstances or something like that. Those are the types of people we kill. And so you are categorically comparing those types of low lives with innocent human beings in the womb that can't do any of those things. Literally the most defenseless human on the planet is one that resides in the womb of their mother. But I'm not sufficiently pro-life because I think that we should take those people out of the gene pool. Sorry, I don't buy it. So another narrative shift that we've seen is woke and kind of lefty Christians. Again, I'm going to let John Cooper do a lot of the talking for me on this, the, this issue. But these Christians were desperately trying to make friends out of people that hate them. So you have a lot of pro-abortion Christians out there kind of posting things or even, you know, supposedly pro-life Christians saying, yeah, we shouldn't really dunk on this issue. And there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of this or that that we have to worry about. But it's all mainly nonsense. And here's one thing I'll kind of give you like a shortcut. If anyone starts their speech or their post on social media with as a pro-choice Christian dot dot dot, just know that you do not have to continue listening to them or reading what they're about to say. That person does not have a grasp of biblical reality or, or just reality in general. You don't have to pay attention to that person. But these people are so desperately trying to signal 
to all these, you know, secular leftists in the community of about how, you know, basically tolerant they are in this particular subject matter. It's gross, actually. And then uh, another shift, which is really interesting, we'll see how this goes as we move into the future, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG, the notorious RBG, she's apparently not the hero that she's been portrayed as because people are just now realizing how narcissistic she was because she could have retired during any of the eight years of the Obama administration when she knew she, she was getting towards the end of her life, but she wanted to stick around. She wanted to stick around so that she could retire under a female president, the first female president being Hillary Clinton. And whoopsies, Donald Trump blew up that plan. And then as opposed to just retiring at that moment, she tried to hang on and hang on, and then she passed away. And again, I don't think it's appropriate to, you know, be excited about the death of someone like that, that I just disagree with, you know, uh, in terms of her jurisprudence or her opinions on these issues. But now we have people on the left coming out saying Ruth Bader Ginsburg was selfish and that she she's the reason why this happened because we got, you know, RBG was traded for ACB. That's an interesting shift. And the last narrative shift I'll talk about before we move on is we all of a sudden need to focus on maternal health. We're hearing a lot of people throwing out maternal health. And so so here's the thing. I, I mean, I fundamentally agree. I fundamentally agree that we should focus on maternal health. So does the entire history of medicine in this country. Because for almost the entirety of human history, the largest risk to the life of the mother was pregnancy and the birthing process for all of human history. But medical advancements have gotten us to the point where that's essentially no longer a factor for women. We have so much available to us, even in poor communities, to save the life of the woman and the child. This idea that women are just dropping like flies over the country, all over the country is just, it's a nonsense, right? So just to kind of give you the, the last year that we have maternal death statistics, uh, typically over the last five years or so, it's somewhere between 650 and 850 women a year die because of something that has to do with a complication with pregnancy or birthing. And, and that's terrible, right? 650 to 850 women, that, that really, really stinks. You hate that for them and their families. But when you compare that, to the somewhere between 800,000 and 1 million children killed per year via abortion? So you want me to focus on maternal health and not celebrate the the potentially hundreds of thousands of babies that are going to be saved every year? Sorry, I'm not buying it. But now we need to shift our focus to uh, the narratives that should have come out since the Dobbs decision was handed down. We just went through all the ones that have come out, but here are the ones that I haven't heard that we should be hearing, and hopefully we hear at some point. The first one, I'm especially passionate about this one, is yes, I'm pro-life, and it's because I'm a Christian, and if you don't like it, pound sand. I'm so tired of these pussy Christians going out there and being like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a Christian, but you know, it's mainly because science and you know, I don't really want to be too judgmental and Jesus was like the lamb of God and stuff. And like, he's this really cool guy. And you know, if you want to meet him, I can maybe introduce you. And like, I just, you know, I'm just trying to love. That's what I'm, I'm just loving people. It's like, nope, I am pro-life. Why are you pro-life? I can give you a bunch of scientific reasons, but I am mainly pro-life because I'm a Christian. Because I believe in the Imago Dei, and I believe each person has a right to life when they're in the womb. That is not a potential person. That is a person with potential, as Ben Shapiro says. Okay? So that's a narrative that needs to get out there. Another narrative that should be coming out is you're damn right we will adopt your baby. Because you hear these people saying, so are you saying more babies are going to be adopted now? Well, yeah. Absolutely. There are people standing outside of abortion clinics Right now, as I record this with signs that say, we will adopt your ba your baby. Please do not kill them. Right? And here's the thing. The reason why there aren't more adoptions because everyone likes to pay, oh, adoption is terrible. And there are a lot of broken things inside the, the adoption you know, thing. I've had a lot of friends that have kind of gone through that process. There are a lot of broken things about that process. But the reason why there aren't more people that are adopted every year in the country is because most of these babies are being killed and not put up for adoption. Most of these women are so selfish that they would rather kill the baby than to ha even fathom the thought of taking the baby and putting it in the hands of another family, okay? So, yes, we're going to see a tremendous uptick in adoptions. Another narrative shift that we should see is, as a church, we haven't been doing all that we can on that issue, on the issue of life, but that ends now. Because something that got exposed over the weekend is the sheer number of churches that have never spent any time or money or effort on this cause. Okay. Now I mentioned my church, you know, here in Edmond, Oklahoma, um, 
the thing about my church is even the pastor, when he was talking about this issue, he's, he's like, you know, we're, we're in the process of trying to figure out what we can do to come around and support these pregnancy resource centers and blah, blah, blah. And all that's great. But what it exposed is that the church, Faith Bible Church in Edmond, Oklahoma, has not really been doing anything in this issue with this issue at all. And I remember years ago, I went to a church here in Oklahoma City called Frontline. And one of the first things I went whenever we became members over there is I was like, hey, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing stuff for the pro-life cause. We want to make sure we're doing stuff, you know, to, to prevent abortions and to help these women and blah, blah, blah. What are you guys doing to do that? And they just kind of looked at me and they were like, I guess we don't really do anything with that. And they're in a community where the abortion rate is decently high when compared to the rest of the state, right? So that got exposed this weekend. So I hope a lot of churches now are like, oh, crap. You know, we just basically have been, you know, operating as if Roe v. Wade was never going to be overturned. We don't really think about this issue. We're just trying to keep the door doors open or keep the thing growing or whatever the situation is. But that ends now because now the, the, the you know, <laughs> you got to put your money where your mouth is. And we'll get more into that in the last section of the show where we talk about what we should be doing now. But another narrative that we should be seeing is that, and again, I keep talking about this, Donald J. Trump is the most pro-life and now one of the greatest presidents in the history of the United States. All things considered, January 6th, the impeachments, the grab the girls by the you know what, like all that stuff, right? And I will keep saying it. And I'm saying it as a guy that hopes he doesn't run for president in 2024. Like the only thing that can save the Democrats right now is Donald Trump running again. That's that's it. They are screwed in 2022 and 2024 unless Donald Trump runs, okay? And we'll get more into that once he announces and we go through all that stuff. But part of me thinks that some people are actually poo-pooing you know, on this ruling, especially the Christians that are poo-pooing on this, because if they didn't poo-poo on it, they might have to actually acknowledge that Trump, this guy that they hate, right, is one of the main reasons why this got done. Because he is. Because say what you want about him, you can say, oh, well, he doesn't believe this in his heart. Well, guess what? He could be pro-abortion in his heart, but he got three justices on the Supreme Court that all voted to overturn Roe v. Wade. So I honestly don't care what he believes in his heart when it comes to what he legislates like. But here you also have to look at, and again, these are just comments, comments from a politician, so I don't really put a whole lot of weight in them. But Trump was asked to comment about this right afterwards, so he did a prepared statement, but then he also uh, did something with Fox. So I'll read something from both of those. So this is from his prepared statement. Quote, Today's decision, which is the biggest win for life in a generation, along with other decisions that have been announced recently, were only made possible because I delivered everything as promised. He still can't avoid being a narcissist, but we'll keep going. Including nominating and getting three highly respected and strong constitutionalists confirmed to the United States Supreme Court, unquote. And then he was also asked uh, by Fox News whether he feels that he played a role in the reversal. And this was literally his response. God made the decision. That was his response to a question. So that wasn't a prepared statement. God made the decision. And later on, he added this. I'll quote him directly. Quote, I think in the end, this is something that will work out for everybody. This brings everything back to the states, which is where it has always belonged. And so, again, that's that's Donald Trump. Like, that should be the narrative from conservatives and just historians is that he is the most pro-life president of all time. And this is his main accomplishment as a president. Okay. Also, a narrative that we should see is that Donald Trump did what almost all the other recent Republican presidents have failed to do. And that is put brave, pro-life, pro-constitution originalists on the Supreme Court. Okay? So Republicans need to wake up and remember their history. They, They really do. They really need to do an accounting of the things that they're seeing. So Mark Thiessen wrote an amazing opinion piece that ended up in the Washington Post of all places. Albert Mueller actually talked about this on, on Monday, I believe, on his show. And there's a great quote from Thiessen's article that Albert Mueller wrote or uh, that he read on air. But I'm going to read a little bit more of the quote here. So it's a somewhat lengthy quote, but I think it's very, very important to kind of explain where Republicans have messed up in the past on this. So let me read again. This is from uh, and I'll make sure this is in the show notes from Mark Thiessen, uh, opinion piece in the Washington Post. Every Republican president before Trump failed miserably when it came to Supreme Court picks. In 1970, Richard M. Nixon nominated Harry A. Blackman, who would go on to be the ignominious author of Roe. Gerald Ford picked only one justice, John Paul Stevens, who made who became the leader of the court's liberal bloc. Ronald Reagan had three appointees, Sandra Day O'Connor, Antonin Scalia, and Anthony M. Kennedy. But only Scalia was a consistent conservative vote on the court. George H.W. Bush named one brilliant conservative, Clarence Thomas, and one catastrophic liberal, David Souter. 
Then you have George W. Bush selected Samuel A. Alito Jr., a marvelous conservative intellect who wrote the decision overturning Roe. But Bush also gave us John G. Roberts Jr., who promised to be an impartial umpire, but instead has repeatedly legislated from the bench, siding with the court's liberal block on a string of cases, including saving Obamacare, preserving the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, DACA, and striking down state laws that required hospitals to extend admitting privileges for doctors who perform abortions. But Trump broke the mold. His nominations of Neil M. Gorsuch, Brett M. Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett have made him the only Republican president in six decades to have a perfect record in appointing judicial conservatives. His picks have transformed the court. With Gorsuch, he saved its conservative majority. With Kavanaugh, he moved the court to the right by replacing a swing vote, Kennedy, with a reliable conservative. And with Barrett, he gave the conservative bloc the five votes they need to prevail without the facilitating or vacillating chief justice. So that is a great breakdown. I absolutely love how he talked through that and went through that. Now we need to talk about another thing that that should be happening, another thing that should have happened, is it's the pro-abortion position that hates women. Okay? That, that's that's what we need to be talking about. The pro-abortion people are the people that hate women, not the people that are pro-life. Okay? So aside from the fact that sex-selective abortions take place all over the country and all over the globe, okay? So let's, let's put that aside. And aside from the fact that millions of unborn females are, are killed every year via abortion across the globe, the pro-abortion perspective tells women that they cannot achieve that they cannot overcome, that they cannot be resilient. That's what the pro-abortion perspective is. They tell these women that the only way that they can make their wildest dreams come true is if they kill the baby that's inside them. Whereas pro-lifers tell the woman, you can overcome, you can achieve, and you can be resilient. And also, we will help you. So I am absolutely tired, especially of conservatives and Republicans and Christians just playing into this nonsense or at least not pushing back against this. No. If you want to say that you are pro-woman, you have to be pro-life. Because again, approximately 50% of the, the people killed in abortions are women. And again, especially in other countries, sex-selective abortions are rampant. In China, in India, in Pakistan, like they're rampant because they don't value women in those cultures. Okay. So enough of this, it's a pro-abortion people that love women. Screw that. Like, that's nonsense. And the last thing in terms of uh, things that we should be shifting is let's not, and this is kind of a minor thing, but kind of not at the same time, let's not lose sight of figuring out who leaked the draft opinion. Because that's one thing that I haven't heard at all in the last week, even from conservatives, is do we know who leaked the opinion yet? Are we just going to forget that? Are we just going to forget that it had to have been somebody from one of the offices of either Sotomayor, uh, Kagan, or uh, Breyer? Are we just going to, we're just, we're just not going to talk about that now? In our excitement and in the ticker tape parades and in, you know, all the confetti, we're just not going to talk about that anymore? No, we still need to keep our eye on the ball and we need to focus on that definitely. Now, here I want to talk just very briefly about what we can expect to see and what we need to watch for. Okay, so what we can expect to see and we need to watch for are blue states are going to enact the most liberal and deadly abortion laws in the entire world, not just in the entire country, but in the entire world. But they will go further than that. They will demand that you celebrate it. Okay, so we're going to have states like, you know, you know, like New York and California and Hawaii and, and, and Illinois and all that. They're going to get it to where. All the abortions in the state are going to be acceptable up until the birth date of the child for any reason whatsoever and taxpayer funded. And if you come from another state, we will fund that as well. Okay. Which would make those the most extreme laws on the books in the entire world. Okay. That they'll be right up there with Canada, which will allow basically an abortion for any reason whatsoever. But it's those next steps where blue states are maybe going to start signaling the perinatal period which can extend up to 28 days after the child is out of the womb, has passed through the magical, you know, vaginal canal and is now in the world. So that's something that we really, really need to be paying attention to because it's going to get really, really bad in those states. Also, something that we, we can can't kind of watch for is whether or not the red state governors will honor all the trigger laws that are now in force, because there are some governors that are like, yeah, I know that that's on the books, but we're not going to enforce that. And We've heard that the Pentagon's not going to, you know, look for enforcement on these different things. So we need to kind of watch these red state governors very, very closely and the attorney generals in those states as well. And another thing that we can expect to see is increased violence towards pro-lifers in churches. Okay. So I put this message out on our Instagram over the weekend 
We have to keep our heads on a swivel because we, our families, our businesses, our churches are now targets for pro-abortion, extremist, Marxist violence. Like that's, that's exactly the case. So if you're a concealed carry person, make sure you conceal carry in your church. Make sure you're keeping your eyes peeled, especially if you go to a large church for people that don't look like they should be there, for people that look like they're about to agitate, like, because these things are going to happen. I hope that they don't. Like, I would love to be proved wrong, but we are going to see increased violence towards pro-lifers in churches. It's almost a guarantee at this point. Now, let me get some uh, random thoughts out there to you as well before we get into some things that we should actually be doing now. So uh, one random thought here is a big thing that you have to keep in mind is what the pro-life side would do if they had unchecked power and what the pro-abortion side would do if they had unchecked power. This kind of helps you figure out which side is more moral. So pro-lifers would make abortion illegal from the moment of conception, okay, and criminalize the entire process. And pro-abortion people would make everything up to infanticide legal for any reason at any point in the pregnancy and taxpayer or business funded. That's the two sides of this issue. Because there, there is no real middle ground in this issue. Like, oh, yeah, it's kind of okay to kill these babies, but not these babies. That's not a real position. If you spend any time really thinking through this, you only end up in one of two places. That abortion is a net positive for humanity, so we should do everything we can to have as many of them as possible, right? Or, this is horrific, we need to criminalize the entire process and prevent as many as we can through the legal system and through the enforcement system, okay? So that, again, tells you who's on the moral side of this issue. Another random thought is... One thing that I find interesting is when a Democrat is directly asked if they support abortion up to the date of birth, because that is the the stated belief of the Democratic National Committee or National Convention or whatever. That is their stated belief. Abortion up to the moment of birth, no exceptions. Okay, but when a prominent Democrat is asked that, they usually go into a plethora of platitudes or bumper sticker slogans about choice and decision between her and her doctor and blah, blah, blah. They can't just say yes. Yes, I support abortion up to the date of birth. Yes, I support a mom and the dad driving to the hospital to deliver, but then veering off to to a different road to actually have them kill the baby as opposed to deliver it. Because that's their answer, but they won't just say that. Okay? Because if they answered yes, that would be the truth. They have to obfuscate, though. Because I think inherently they realize how unbelievably evil and ridiculous and crazy their position is. Another random thought here is you have so many pro-abortion people right now talking about how this law is going to be killing women. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but they're ignoring the fact that there are tons of females that are going to be saved by this ruling. Uh, So these people are, when they say that they're either ignorant or they're purposefully misleading you. So to repeat something that I've said a bunch of times, you know, a, a bunch of times on this podcast is abortion is never medically necessary to save the life of the mother ever. We have to remember that we have to keep beating that home. Another random thought is, isn't it so interesting that you're seeing people online complain about how this is just going to negatively affect hookup culture? This has been one of the most interesting things I've seen is they're lamenting the fact that this is going to affect how I like to hook up with people. I normally like to just grab my phone and swipe, swipe, swipe. Yeah, you look like I could put some seed in you. Uh, You know, yeah, let's let's kind of hook up, not even learn each other's names, have sex and just kind of move on with our lives. So this just goes to further prove that a lot of the people... You know, a lot of the men and women, they were using abortion as an extra layer of contraception, which we have been reliably informed never happens, right? But again, they're lamenting that. These Gen Zers, there was an article over the weekend, actually several articles about Gen Zers changing their sexual habits because of this ruling. And they're describing it as this horrible thing. And I'm like, this is a great thing. This is an amazing thing. You're adjusting your personal decision making based on the potential ramifications of this law. It's making you think about whether or not just randomly hooking up with people that you met that night is a good thing. It's almost as if there was a purpose behind how we are supposed to have sex, that a baby being conceived from a sexual act is a positive thing. And we should look at it that way. I actually love what Steven Crowder says all the time. He's mentioned this on the show a whole bunch. And I I shared it again on Instagram. Women have four options for their sex lives. They don't have one forced pregnancy or whatever these idiots are saying, they have four options for their sex life. Abstinence, contraception, motherhood, adoption. There is no fifth option. Abortion is not a realistic option. So again, abstinence, contraception, motherhood, adoption. Okay? 
And to all these people that are like, oh, these poor women, and they're not using it as birth control, about 45% of abortions, almost half of the abortions in, in America are repeat abortions. People that knew what they were doing the first time, and they're just doing it again. So again, I am glad that more people are not looking at, as, uh, at abortion as if it's another layer. So it's like, okay, we got the condom, we got the diaphragm, we got the spermicidal lube, and then we've got abortion. No, they are splitting those things up entirely, and I think that's great. Another random thought here is that elections so clearly have consequences and, and not just on a national level, but especially on a state level. Cause look where we're at now. We're getting a full dose of that. Now this just shows you how important it is to focus on local politics as opposed to federal politics. Now, federal politics are obviously important, especially when you're electing, you know, your, your house of representatives, members that are going to go, go to the U S Congress when you're uh, getting your senators, when you're voting for president, all those things are very, very important, but it's your state legislatures that are right now making the abortion laws. OK, and also we have to remember that elections count in the future because it is not crazy to think that as soon as liberals get a majority on the Supreme Court, which will will definitely happen again at some point in our future, that there is going to be a case brought up that they will try to reinstate the federal allowance for the procedure of abortion and to usurp state laws, kind of like what Roe v. Wade did immediately. And so when you're voting for president. When you're voting for your senator that you're going to send to the United States Congress, you have to keep this in mind. All of those things matter. And the last random thought I'll get into here is it is very, very interesting to me watching people have to deal with, you know, kind of the mental gymnastics of a woman named Amy Coney Barrett being a part of the decision to overturn Roe. Because in one way, it cuts against their argument and their narrative that it's just a bunch of men that are deciding this, Right. Because one of them was a woman that's, that helped decide this. So what they are doing is just dismissing Amy Coney Barrett as a, as a handmaiden, right? Oh, she's just a handmaiden, right? But what they're also ignoring is that there are three female justices on the Supreme Court right now. And only one of them has children. You want to take a guess who it is? It's ACB. She has seven children. Seven. Sotomayor and Kagan have zero. So the mental gymnastics of somehow Amy Coney Barrett being this horrible, horrific extremist, but not Sotomayor and Kagan. Is it possible that if Sotomayor and Kagan had had children that they would have thought differently on this issue? Perhaps not, because we saw a bunch of women walking around outside the Supreme Court that were pregnant that had written on their stomach, not yet human. Right. Which I would say you're not yet smart if you think that. But again, we, we would just kind of see. But it, the, the mental gymnastics are absolutely incredible at this point. But we're going to bring it to a close today by talking about a very, very important section. I know here we are an hour in, but this is very, very important. It's the work that needs to be done now. This is very, very important. It's the next steps. So you popped bottles. You had a cigar. And that's what I did Friday night last week. Popped open a new bottle of whiskey, had a cigar, really, really enjoyed it. But by Saturday morning, hey, it's time to get to work. So here's a bunch of things we need to consider. First, supporting pregnancy resource centers and their affiliate programs with our time and money. Okay? And just as a side note, governors need to ensure that those facilities are secured. Those, those facilities need to make sure they have private security so that they can make sure things are all squared away. But those organizations, they need your time. They need your money. They need your donations. They need all of it. So for all you guys that were dunking and high-fiving and sending around the memes and, and doing all the things, look up the, you know, some people call them emergency pregnancy centers, but they're just pregnancy resource centers. Okay. Look them up in their area more than ever. They're going to need your help. And we need to make sure as a body of Christ, as churches, as whatever, that we were doing everything we can to support them. Okay. Another thing we need to do, the body of Christ must do what we can to flood adoption agencies and to empty the foster care roles. I heard of a couple different communities, uh, a couple of different churches, rather, I can't remember who said this, but they basically wiped out the foster care system in their area around their church because they basically adopted all the kids that were in foster care. All the families that were looking, like, or were looking to get rid of their children, right, to give up their rights to their children, these churches in these areas basically they, they absorbed all of that so much so that the, the government municipality in their area was helping fund these organizations so that they could keep doing it. And I know the adoption uh, process is crazy. I know the foster care system to, in a lot of ways is broken, but as the body of Christ, can you imagine in your community, if there are no foster kids to go around, if every time a foster kid comes to the system, they're placed immediately 
if if every time uh, there was somebody that needed to be adopted, that there was a family there, that should be a major, major focus. Also, we need to move our legislative focus to a fight for the full criminalization of abortion in all 50 states. So, Roe, in case you're overturned on the national level and Supreme Court, now we need to work on all the states. Because there are 25 states with, with these restrictions, but there's very, very few states that have full restrictions on abortion. Again, saving the life of the mother is not a real category, but even in my home state of Oklahoma, we supposedly have this strong law, but it, it, it allows you know uh, abortions for the cases of rape and incest. The problem with that is obviously a baby should not get the death penalty for something that their father did. I say that all the time. So that's the next legislative focus, fight for the full criminalization of abortion in all 50 states. Also, we need to focus on a federal abortion ban for all abortions, for all reasons and circumstances. Because that's something that that could happen, and this kind of goes into the next thing, which is maybe adding unborn children to the 14th Amendment. Okay, so this was the 14th Amendment. This was passed by Congress in 1866 and ratified in 1868. So what it did is it extended both the civil and legal rights for black citizens who were formerly enslaved. It, it granted them citizenship. And, and basically the, the text is this, all persons born or, natural, uh, born or naturalized in the United States. Okay, and it ensured rights to these people in states where discriminatory laws were, were on the books. Okay, now. In order to get an amendment passed, so I don't, I think it's the same process to get something added to an amendment, but in order to just get a, an amendment passed, basically for a federal abortion ban, you know, there are two methods of doing that. So according to Article 5, it prescribes that amendments may be proposed either by one, the United States Congress, which would need two thirds votes in, you know, both the House and the Senate, or the second way is a constitutional convention of states uh, when and if it's demanded in two thirds of the states and the legislatures of those states would have to vote for that. So those are high bars, two thirds of the United States Congress or, uh, you know, basically the House and the Senate or two thirds of the states. It's going to take a lot, but it's super duper worth it. So either getting a federal abortion ban with a new amendment to the Constitution or getting unborn children added to the 14th Amendment. Let's focus on that. Also, criminalizing abortion by mail. So there are a lot of pills that you can get sent in the mail, like you're ordering from Amazon, and you can kill your babies by doing that. Now, aside from the fact that a lot of these, uh, you know, abortion by mail pills are very, very dangerous for young women, and it's very, very dangerous to anyone that takes them, it's obviously incredibly lethal for the baby because there's almost a 100% chance that the baby will die. And so the shipping around some of these abortion pills are going to be meant to kind of usurp some of the law. So let's say you, you live in one of those states that has a full outright ban of abortion, you're, you're going to be able to get these, these pills in the mail. And so we should make it as difficult, if, if not impossible, for this to get in the hands of women, right? Because we're not going to be able to stop it in the states that love abortion, the Californias, the New Jerseys, and Illinois, and all those types of things. But in our states that are going to be banning this, these red states, we have to make sure that, that we can't have our babies killed by people just basically shipping in you know, stuff in a, you know, uh, a package that doesn't have any labeling on it or something like that. Also, a couple of things left here. I want us to focus on actually making abortion unthinkable, okay? But but not in the way that people are using it, as I talked about earlier, okay? Where people are like, let's make it unthinkable. Let's pass all these, you know, lefty you know, policy prescriptions or something like that. I want it to be unthinkable because people accept the truth of the gospel and it changes their hearts and desires. Because people don't want to talk about this issue as if it's a, go it's a gospel issue. And I get, you know, arguing about how we should ban abortion because of science and because of what we know about what's going on in terms of the development of the fetus and all that. Like, I get it. I'm down with all that. But at the end of the day, women would not be scared and they would not be wanting to kill their baby. And the men in their life would not be, you know, encouraging them or maybe in some cases forcing them or their families wouldn't be so caught up in their own narcissism that they would, you know, want the baby to be killed so it doesn't reflect on them. None of those things would happen if those people had a gospel worldview. If these people were Christians, that's how you make abortion unthinkable. And that's what we really, really need to focus on. Let's really make it unthinkable. Let's share Christ with these pregnant women. Let's share Christ with women before they get pregnant. Okay. That's how you make it unthinkable. And the last point of the day is you guys. So I'm talking to you. So if you've been hanging with me this whole time, you're in it to win it, right? You guys must constantly remind yourselves how to successfully push back against pro-abortion arguments. You cannot get flat-footed. So one, one of the canned speeches that I do, so if you bring me out to speak to your men's group or to your church or to your, your company or whatever, I talk about how to engage pro-abortion arguments. It's basically what I did in episode 257 of this po you know, podcast. 
And that's very, very important because you're going to have a lot of people throwing things out on social media, which by again, as a sidebar, don't get into social media arguments with people about this issue. I know you feel the, the need to push back, but no one's changing their mind on social media. They're just not, not in DMS, not on their Facebook wall. None of those things. Just let those things go by. If somebody said something, cause I've done this since last Friday, I feel like people have said things that are factually inaccurate. So I contact them personally. Cause I know them personally. I send them a direct message personally. And I say, Hey, I think you're wrong on this issue. Uh, can we talk about it? Here's my phone number. Or we already have each other's phone number. And I just call them type of a thing, but you can't even have those discussions with people. If they can basically tear down your entire wall by saying, yeah, you know, but if the, if the woman's raped, I guess we can kill that baby, right? Like we, we can't do that. We can't have that because what you guys have to remember is that we have truth on our side. You know, God is on the side of life. God is the creator and author of life, right? He, he gave his image to us as image bearers. And we have to remember that we have the truth. The other side does not. All right, guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost at Undaunted Life. Our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So a lot of links for you today. I'll go through them. So I've got the actual decision so you can read it for yourself. I've got the legal breakdown that I talked about from Ben Shapiro and the woke lefty Christian breakdown from John Cooper. I've got a link to my episode 257, How to Engage Pro-Abortion Arguments, and then both books that I talked to you about, Abortion by R.C. Sproul and What to Say When by Sean Carney and Steve Carlin. And then I've also got that uh, Mark Thiessen opinion from the Washington Post. It's called For the Fall of Roe v. Wade. Thank you, Donald Trump. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it wherever you're listening to this. Please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Ties, which is off their 10th anniversary anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.